Hey there friends, Dave Pilatus, Canada Missing Project, a copyrighted edition for a video channel. And I'm here for a missing persons video only. Thanks for being here. And a uh, couple of things right from the get-go. Just lately I've had a lot of people say, Dave, uh, really like your first two movies. Why don't you do a third one? So, the documentaries I've done, Missing 411 and Missing 411 The Hunted, the links are on the um, description of this video site. And you can watch them for free on YouTube right now. And please spread them around. Get everyone to watch them because that helps us. But understand something. There's people that make one documentary every three or four years and that's their full-time job. Yeah. So I came out with two in a little over two and a half years, plus writing books, plus doing research, plus, plus, plus. And what I learned very rapidly when I did the first one, it's a huge undertaking, huge. It was a huge educational learning curve for me to understand all the different facets that go into making a movie. Legally, professionally, sound, color, music, storyline, clearances. I could go on and on. So what you see and you watch for your 90 minutes and you go, oh, that was interesting. That was a one year effort by probably 25 people, 30 people, minimum. And to give you an example, I did a special for the History Channel called Vanished. They still own it. It's on Amazon. It's called Vanished. And it's about my work. I know the budget for that because I was one of two executive producers for that. So I had my hands all over the budget, producers, directors, etc. Budget for that was $720,000 for less than two hours worth of special. That's how expensive this stuff is. And you got to beg, borrow from everyone you know. Um, sometimes you got to ask people for favors. You do it for the love of it. You don't do it for many other reasons. And as I get more mature, I realize that the people in my life are much more important then going to a conference, standing in front of people, I really appreciate that anybody wants to see me. But as you get older, to me, it's very appealing to just staying at home and doing research. Because when you're doing a documentary, I think the last one was seven states that we filmed in. It was a horrific schedule. It was filled with problems, wrought with issues I could never could have imagined. So when people say, well, why don't you make a third one? Well, I'm definitely not saying I'm not, but I've encountered so many issues with people not wanting to work, people not being reputable, people doing subpar work, it's disgusting. It's disgusting to find someone who is proud of their work, willing to work hard, because that's one of the things in my documentaries. We go to those places where these people disappeared. I'm not one of these persons that's going to do a recreation in a studio. We go there. And if the people can't keep up, well, then we get rid of them. And if a videographer can't keep up, well, then we'll find another one. I've been to some of the most beautiful places in the world because of this. It's hard to appreciate it knowing what happened in these places though. That's the issue. So when you say, hey Dave, why'd you make another movie? <laughs> I know I reach more people through movies than I do for my books. Uh, I think the last time uh, Missing 411, our first movie was on YouTube. Uh, we reach several million people. So I know the reach is there. And 
I just got to get the energy, the money. I've got the stories to go do it. So hold on to your hats. Hopefully someday I'll, I'll be close again. Today, we're going to talk about missing people. And I've got some really, really interesting stories for you. First letter. Hey, Dave. Once a month or so, I tried to hike up Mount San Gregorio in California, elevation 11,400. This hike was done via the Vivian Creek Trail, which is labeled difficult, and it would take me approximately six hours. It was around the first week of July in 99, and usually I tried to do it no later than that because the heat of the summit, there's no shade, and during the day, you fry on the way up there. Anyway, this day, started around 9 a.m., figured I'd be reaching the summit by 3 Nothing went without a hitch. Everything went without a hitch, but around 10,000 feet, a thunderstorm started rolling in and I hightailed it up until it started pouring. I found a downed tree where I decided to hunker down and wait out the storm. I was getting pounded with hail, but I was prepared and covered myself with a strong waterproof poncho. And while I was waiting, I heard some hikers coming down. Congratulations to this person. They did the smart thing. You don't hike in bad weather. And why don't you? Multitude of reasons. First of all, it's slippery. And you could get hurt, blow a knee, blow a tendon. It's not worth it. Sit down, find some cover, preferably under some gigantic boulders that won't move, and wait it out. So I popped my head out to see the group of around seven were working their way down the mountain, and one even yelled out to me, hey, you're a brave man to wait it out. Within 20-some minutes, the rain and hail had stopped, but it was still dark and cloudy, so I continued to the summit. And at around 10,800, I was above the storm cloud line, and it was sunny. Blue skies, no wind, and very calm. I summited, and like always, signed in the summit log. For some of you who don't know, you get to the summit of a lot of big mountains, and there's usually some kind of sealed can, uh, I've seen army ammunition buckets, all kinds of things. And inside there's usually a little uh, like notepad or something. And you can uh, write your name in there and put a few notes and the date and the time. And it's fun to read what other, other people have written too. So he signed the log. And uh, this is your typical summit with granite rocks stacked in half moon shapes about two to three feet high to block the winds for shelter on one side. So I set up my tent, relaxed, I read a little, and around six o'clock I made my dinner and sat out drinking a coffee waiting to see if any other hikers would come up. But no one else came. Now around nine o'clock I decided it was time for bed, so I slipped in my sleeping bag and was getting comfy when I heard a loud voice call out my name. Now this voice wasn't like any voice. Imagine someone with the lung capacity of seven men calling out your name with force. You knew like when we try to get our dog's attention and we say, hey, well, that's what I heard. So I turned on my headlamp and unzipped my tent and got out thinking I'd find a friend who knew I'd been there and decided to come up and play a prank on me in the dark. I called out, but no answer. I looked around and I didn't see anything. I went back into my tent and thought, okay, maybe I was hearing things. So again, I slipped in my I slipped in my bag and I just turned off my headlamp when the voice called out my name again. So I got out of my tent, headlamp on, and said, What? I'm right here. But all was silent. And after a minute, I went back in my tent, back into my bag, turned off the headlamp, and once more the voice called out my name, but this time I just laid there and prayed out loud, and I must have fallen asleep while praying. Because when I woke up, the sun was coming out, which I found very strange because I normally wake up and go to the bathroom at least three times during the night, but this night I didn't. All this happened before I looked into the Bigfoot phenomena or had any experience with such things, but I am a believer in Christ and know that the Lord hears our prayers and he protects us. This, uh, this event happened about five months after the, uh, another incident. Thank you, Dave, for what you do, and I pray for you and your Angie daily. Thank you. Thank you. I have a friend. She lives uh, up in the mountains in Colorado. And uh, she has neighbors fairly close by. But one night, she thought she heard baby kittens crying. 
And subsequent to that, I've had a talk with her and I said, I don't care what you hear. You don't go outside in the middle of the night when you're alone. Don't do it. Period. Boop. Don't. Mm, mm, nope. Nope. I don't care if you have a gun, you have anything. You don't go outside at dark alone. That's my rule. Period. Next letter, Dave. I'd appreciate anonymity in the story. Absolutely. Anyone asks for it, they got it. My name is Blank. I live in Michigan, and I'm big into mountain biking. I'm also a USMC, United States Marine Corps combat vet with numerous deployments under my belt. I've been all over the world, 17 countries, and never had an encounter like this. So first, first thing, mountain bikers have disappeared. And I mean bike and everything disappeared. So don't think that because you're a mountain biker, you can be safe. I was at Whole Bridge Mountain Biking Park in Holly, Michigan in October of 2021. Holly's just northwest of Detroit. Apologies, I don't remember the exact day, just that it was unseasonably warm that evening. I was alone on the trail that night. The parking lot was empty before and after my ride. The trail was dark and it was about 15 minutes into a 50 minute ride. It's four miles of pretty serious trail. When I became aware of something else with me on that trail. I will say I never once saw anything, never smelled anything, but I heard plenty. I had something that tracked me at a speed of about three and a half miles through three and a half miles of forest. Plenty of roots, rocks, thumps, and small lakes. I usually average seven to eight miles an hour over that terrain, even in the dark. I have plenty of lightning from nighttime riding. Whatever this was had no problem keeping pace, even though it was off trail. That's pretty remarkable. It stayed consistently at my four to five o'clock and seven to eight o'clock positions based on my direction. I audibly tracked it to my left and right, but it always stayed just out of range. The feeling of dread that accompanied this was remarkable. It felt like a heavy fog, but with physical weight that permeated the forest. I'm a big experienced fella and I was as scared as I've ever been as an adult. It had literal weight to it. As a side note, I've always been acutely aware of my surroundings. So much so it gives my family the willies. I always chalked it up to childhood trauma finely honed by the Marines. Again, I didn't see any, I didn't see a thing and have no proof at all, but I know that this thing was there. It seemed to stay just out of reach of the radar like it knew I had it. I'm also handicapped, but I'm still very active. I've had four final pelvic fusion surgeries and seven on my back in total. Lots of titanium inside there. I have no idea what this was, but it definitely felt something way nastier than me was in those word, woods. It was legitimate fear, cold fear. I forced myself to complete the ride, the, mo the monkey part of my brain screaming at me the entire time, that never happens. I contemplated turning around, but honestly, I was so afraid I'd snap if I acknowledged was go what was going on and acted on it. Something was telling me that turning around was a bad idea. Couldn't tell you why. It stayed with me until I cleared the woods back at the trailhead, open parking lot. I'm out there as much as anyone and never had anything like this happen before. Can't explain it. Don't have any evidence. Last thing, I recently did a 23andMe DNA test and discovered that I have more Neanderthal DNA than 94% of the planet. I also have 5% native DNA Cheyenne Arapaho for whatever it's worth. Hope this finds you well. Thanks for your time. Cheyenne Arapaho, my best friend. <laughs> Harvey Pratt is a chief in the Cheyenne Arapaho tribe. Look him up. Harvey Pratt from Oklahoma. Outstanding individual. So a couple things about that. Mountain bikers have disappeared. Uh, I've written about them. Without a trace, nothing. Uh, now something that can keep up with you at that speed, off trail in a forest where you can't see, has to be remarkable. Definitely not a bike, not a motorcycle. Couldn't do it off trail. I would think it would be an orb, except the thing was making sounds, so it was breaking branches and things. But Michigan's a strange state. I've written a lot about cases there, so thanks for the note. I'd like to thank you. Next, next letter. 
I'd like to thank you for the work you have done in both law enforcement and as a researcher. Your work ethic and productivity is inspiring to me, and I greatly respect that you bring a level head and an open mind to any topics you pursue. I heard of Missing 411, but was not a serious follower of your research until I started looking for answers following an odd experience I had years ago. I'm a registered nurse and work night shift in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Oh no, another Michigan story. So I often went for walks in the city on my nights off. On a fall night in 2018, around 11.30, I'm leaving Anab Owen, that's A-H-N-A-B-A-W-E-N Park, and was walking east on a bridge crossing the Grand River. There was a sound and a light to my immediate left side that suddenly caught my attention. The sound was like that of a stone hitting the water, but the sound was muffled. The light was bright in appearance, about 10 feet across and 2 feet in height. It started at eye level very near me and glided to the north, cutting up and down several times before vanishing it got about 100, yards, 100 feet away. The whole event lasted 5 seconds. I remember being very surprised, scared, and exclaiming, what was that? Weird. Thinking that the people who were walking up in front of me on the bridge had obviously witnessed this too. To my surprise, they were no longer there, even though I had just seen two men and a woman up ahead of me on that bridge. This disturbed me, and I, rem and I remembered checking my watch, which said it was 3 a.m. I then decided that I must have been confused and that I should walk home. I did not know what to do, so I entered the experience in my journal and pushed it out of my mind as much as I could. I have no way to account for the missing time and have no memories of it either. I think the thing that bothers me the most is how close this light was to the most that it almost seemed to have a split off from my body, causing me to momentarily seize and disorient. I do not know how else to describe it other than I felt violated. Reflecting on this event is difficult and the experience has contributed to me almost never going for night walks anymore, even though they were something that I greatly enjoyed. I've note is that this happened directly over a river. I'm roughly 50% German. I was alone and I didn't have any drugs or alcohol in my system. Thank you for sharing the people's thoughts and letters as it has been helpful for me to know that there's others with experiences like this. Please keep doing what you do. Thank you. Fascinating. Maybe it did come out of you. I don't know. I've heard all kinds of stories about orbs. They're obviously some type of energy. Um, are they transporting something? Are they a transport vehicle for a drone, say? I don't know. Hey David, I've been following your stuff for a number of years and I've been listening to your YouTube channel. Thank you for all you do. I was sorry to hear about your son. The fact that you talk so openly about grief and the suicide epidemic in this country is really commendable. As someone who struggles with depression and have had multiple attempts, it really gives me a different perspective on things. I fell on hard times a few years back, broke up with the woman I thought I'd marry. My father passed away and then COVID hit, one thing after another. Anyways, I'm just taking care of my mother and I still battle serious depression, but Hearing about how devastating suicide is to the family and her friends you leave behind, it makes me want to stick around, even when it gets hard. Hearing you talk about that and what your experience in bringing up the suicide rates, it does help, and I appreciate it. It's kind of why I do it, and I appreciate that there's somebody out there who takes it to heart, what I'm saying. Anyways, here's a story for you. The first one happened around 04 or 05, maybe earlier, maybe 2001. My parents had a cabin up in the highest part of the Lower Peninsula in Michigan. Another Michigan story. Right on the water, really beautiful up there. Me and my friend went to go take a walk through the woods to get to his house on the other side that was rumored to be haunted. We were maybe 15 or 16 at the time. Now this should have been just a straight shot through the woods. Right before we entered the woods, we turned around and saw a black cat cross out our, our path, which should have been a bad sign right there. Anyways, we started going through the woods and we must have gotten turned around or something, but we realized we were lost. 
We went in around early afternoon, around one or two, and we were lost maybe four or five hours. We we're starting to get scared that we might have to spend the night in the woods, debating if we should sleep in shifts or in case of predators. And I told my friend that I would take the watch if it just came down to that. But then I saw a telephone poles and we would follow it to a road. We saw signs for the lighthouse and we knew we were pretty far from where we started. We asked a passing jogger which way our town was and she pointed us in the right direction. We started walking. My dad was driving all over looking for us and he managed to find us walking back. Now here's the strange part. When we got home, we looked on the map and we realized that we got out of the woods 20 miles from where we entered. None of us could believe it. There's no way we could have physically traveled that distance in the amount of time we were gone. 20 miles in decent weather conditions is doable, but we were turned around backtracking, rest, resting from time to time, thinking what to do. Going through thick brush, there's no way we could have gone that distance. We joke that we must have gone through a portal or a time loop or something. But after you're hearing your missing 411 stuff, I wonder if that actually did happen to us. Stranger things have happened in the woods. Second story wasn't in the woods, but it was still strange, and I don't know what to make of it. My friend and I were walking behind the senior center close to our house, looking for a place to smoke. We were maybe 14 or 15 at the time, but this is the weirdest thing. It looked like a plane had crashed right into the side of the building. There was a man in a suit in a black unmarked car, and he was talking to a construction worker. They had some of those construction barricades around the lights on it around the accident scene. We wanted to look closer and ask questions, but they were both looking at us and we decided not to since we had some uh, pot on us. But the whole wall was messed up, bricks and debris everywhere. It looked like a part of a cockpit or something. It didn't look like a car, it didn't look like something from a plane, so we decided to go back the next day after school and check it out. We go back the next day, the very next day, and it was gone. The wall was fixed, no plane, no debris, no construction barricade, no paint job, nothing. It looked like nothing had happened. People thought we were making it up. I still don't know what to make of it. We know that we saw, we know what we saw though. The world is a strange place, nothing on the news about it, so I don't understand how we could have cleaned it up less than a day. And what was the deal with the G-man looking guy? You'd think they'd have regular police and fire department on scene, not someone in an unmarked car. So many questions. Were they possibly from another dimension, like some other stories you've read about where people have said in the past? I don't know. A plane crashing into a building so soon after 9-11 would have probably been pretty newsworthy. My father was also close with the local fire and police as well as the mayor, and he probably would have heard about it, but nothing. No one seems to know anything about it. Really weird. I'd say so. Never heard a story about that or like that before. Next story. On the podium of miracles, without a doubt, the rescue carried out by a dog that managed to hold a three-year-old boy who had fallen into a lagoon and the owner of the field who had pulled him out of the water occupies first place. But enjoy for the people of Baran de Estrada. Stop. The story was carried several news agencies. I'll show you where it was at first. South America, Argentina, Argentina. This is the city where this incident happened. Okay. Start again for you. On the podium of miracles, without a doubt, the rescue carried out by a dog that managed to hold a three-year-old boy who had fallen into a lagoon <clears throat> and the owner of the field who pulled him out of the water occupies first place for these hours in the joy of the people of Baron de Estrada. <clears throat> but in the midst of so much joy, concern, and mysticism are mixed, since they attribute the fact that the little boy was taken by El Pombero, P-O-M-B-E-R-O, <clears throat> almost three kilometers away. It was the widow of the former mayor, Curie, who managed to get the child out of the mirror of water, alerted by the barking of the dog. The story with police overtones and quite a lot of popular beliefs happened yesterday morning, 
date on this article is April 7th this year. Happened yesterday morning in Barone de Estrada, Mariela Escalante, owner of the butcher shop in Toro Piche area, was unloading some cattle when her almost three-year-old son, so he was only two, Sebastian decided to leave, heading in an uncertain direction from a truck. One of his aunts saw him go to the house of another relative that is only a few meters away. In the rural areas, this is common. He was dressed in his Captain America cape and told me he was going to go look for his comic book character. Today, he didn't have classes, and I knew he was going to see my sister. But he's never got there, he told it. But he never got there, he told the newspaper Mariella Escalante. Immediately, we started looking for him through the neighbor's houses where he usually goes, and we didn't find him. I called my brother, who was a police officer, and we alerted firemen, and the whole town got involved. We live in desperate times, the woman said, still anguished. But Sebastian did not go alone. Morocho, M-O-R-O-C-H-O, accompanied him on the trip, his woolly puppy that goes with him everywhere. After almost two desperate hours, the police received a call that a boy had been rescued from inside a lagoon. The notice was given by Gladys Arguello, widow of a former mayor, Curie, who was touring her field when she heard Morocho barking. The baby had gotten into the water and the dog was trying to drag him, holding his cape and her teeth. Gladys did not hesitate. She jumped into the lagoon and managed to get the boy out. Quote, he never went very far from home. He does not know the mountain. He walked almost three kilometers, crossed seven wire fences and two mountains to get there. We found zigzag tracks in the mountain and this is not natural. We are sure that Sebastian, the Pomberito, kidnapped. This is not the first time that a boy is lost and found far away from the area, said Mariella, slipping a hypothesis into this whole story that many of her cases is not easy to digest as real. But this inside, he is very rooted in popular beliefs. After his rescue, the boy returned home, managed to take a nap, and when he awoke, while having a snack, he told his mom that he had gone to rescue Captain America. Sebastian was checked out by a doctor from a local hospital and advised his mother to give him a hot bath and something to eat because they could still see him, excited by the strange and dangerous experience he had to live. We are waiting for the priest to come to my house and give him a new baptismal blessing. We, we here believe that this being kidnapped by my son, Mariella emphasized. The young mother had words of gratitude for Gladys Arguello, quote, if she hadn't heard the dogs barking and she had gotten into the pond to get my son out, today we, he would have drowned, she concluded. Believe it or not. But the story of Mariella and Sebastian is not the only one of the same characteristics. Several local sources consulted by time coincided in reoccurring another similar event that occurred a few years ago and that had another child and victim. The story of the locals indicates that he had also disappeared under similar circumstances and that he was forced in the vicinity of where Siba was located. Unlike this child, the victim was speechless and could never tell how she had gotten to that place. Stop there. I've written about many people with extreme disabilities and many kids that had disabilities that could not explain what happened to them. Right on target. Now the first boy who disappeared, found in water with a dog, far from his house, over mountains and fences? I don't think so. If you're familiar with 411 stories, this one's right in the ballpark. But if there is something that all these consultants agree on, it is that behind these disappearances would be a myth of, <laughs> here we go, mythological goblin with a gloomy appearance and that according to stories carried down from generation to generation has among its particular behaviors the kidnapping of kids. I told you before, many countries have these stories and have something from the past that's carried forward in mythology. The truth is that, fortunately, Sebastian was located healthy and with his mother. Mariella hopes, with the passing of days, that her son will finally tell her how he managed to travel the distance and separate her house from the lagoon in which she almost was drowned. And that would be the story. But with many of these, the kids can't tell 
they're too young, too afraid, don't have the words to, to describe what happened. So one child couldn't speak, and another child so young couldn't say what happened. Fascinating stuff. A few videos ago, I talked to you about there's no need to go to college. And there are so many jobs right now for plumbers, electricians, etc. I just had a plumber at my house the other day. Young man, very smart. We had this discussion. And he says, yeah, I'm, I'm making really good money. I could be hired right now by four or five different plumbing outfits in Northern Montana. There's a huge need. And he goes, you know, Dave, he says, everyone's gonna need a plumber one day. That's right, everyone will eventually. So plumbers, electricians, all kinds of labor fields make good money and uh, you can be there quickly a couple three years and you can be behind in your apprentice and be a journeyman so please pay attention try so the stories i'm going to tell you today involve michigan <laughs> lots of very strange things going on in that state and i've written dozens and dozens of stories First one, first thing, many of you may have heard these stories from someplace. Some were on TV. They, they didn't even scratch the surface of the truth behind how all this is intertwined. And that's why I'm going to talk to you. Now, a lot of what I'm going to talk to you about incur, occurred in that southern area of Lake Michigan. And then other parts of the story occurred way in the far north where Michigan goes up to Lake Superior. So pay attention. June 23rd, 1950. Northwest Airlines Flight 2501 from LaGuardia International Airport in New York was bound for Seattle with a stop in Minneapolis. 55 passengers and a crew of three. This is what the plane kind of looked like. They were old uh, military cargo planes that were transfixed into planes to fly people. Now, the DC-4, which it was called at the time, had a pilot named Robert Lind and a co-pilot named Vern Wolf. Very experienced pilots. Here you go. And they had a flight attendant named Bonnie Feldman, 25 years old. Well, their flight path took them from LaGuardia over Lake Michigan and towards Minnesota. Well, Lynn realized as he was approaching Michigan that there were storms over the lake and requested a him to decline to or decline to 4,000 feet. FAA declined his request. 55 minutes later, he requested again, saying weather was heavy ahead, and he got it to 3,500 feet, and he lowered his elevation. At 11:37 that night, Flight 2501 reported over Battle Creek, Michigan, bad weather, and asked to lower his elevation again. It was denied. Well, at midnight, he failed to report in. And that was odd. And on June 24th, the next morning, when they failed to make their landing site in Minneapolis, they were finally declared missing. An entire plane, 58 people. So initially it was thought that they crashed near Wisconsin. Then it was determined they really crashed near Michigan on the far east side of the lake. Well, St. Joseph, Michigan is where they found some twisted pieces of metal and some small pieces of human flesh they claimed. 
nothing large was found. Many passengers, the vast majority of these passengers on this plane were young college students heading home for the summer. Now, June 27th, the US Navy sent out a contingent of several dive teams on boats to look for the wreckage. There was a seven day underwater search and they decided then that the most likely site was 10 to 13 miles southwest, or correct that, northwest of Benton Harbor, Michigan. So here's the lake. Benton Harbor's right here. This is South Haven. And this is an area of Wisconsin where I have written about a series of students that disappeared in water. And that is and missing 411, a sobering coincidence. Many Wisconsin college students vanished here. Well, many college students heading home vanished here. Keep that in mind. This is a twist in the story I've never told anybody, and this is the reason I'm, I'm taking this segment to talk to you about it. Well, at the time, Captain Lynn requested to decline in elevation. It was an electrical storm over the lake. Being an extreme, uh, an experienced pilot, he knew he didn't want to fly into that. Well, what the Navy did with the bits and pieces of human flesh, they say they put it in an unmarked grave in Michigan. Well, back in 1950, they didn't have DNA or the ability to look at DNA. Where are those body parts? Nobody was ever identified. Now, Malaysia Flight 370 disappeared over the Indian Ocean in one of the biggest pieces of open water in the world. Northwest, Northwest Flight 2501 disappeared in an area of southern Lake Michigan. Where is it? That's a very good question because in the years since, our ability to detect things underwater has vastly improved. We now have side scan sonar which can make the bottom look like, ah, uh, just lights up and you know exactly what's on the bottom. And many, many people have side scanned this area of Michigan all the way from Benton to South Haven. And they describe the bottom as smooth and nothing there. Well, when you got a plane the size of this, where are the engines? Where are the tires? Where is the fuselage? It's somewhere it doesn't disappear, does it? In this instance, it did. And here we are, 71 years later, never been found. An entire commercial flight gone with students on it. And that's the beginning of this story. Next story, also involves Michigan, also involves Southern Lake Michigan, also includes the area I just told you. Edward Dwan, D-W-A-N, William Sells, and Rodney Lewis. Missing January 13th, 1967, Benton Harbor, Michigan. Benton Harbor, son of a gun. Didn't I just tell you about Benton Harbor? And that's the area where they thought that the plane was gonna commercial plane might be. Benton Harbor, right here. Benton Harbor. Well, Dwan was a World War II distinguished flyer, got the Distinguished Flying Cross for flying during that war. He had 10,000 hours in the sky. He was considered an expert pilot by friends and comrades. He owned a, a moving company in Benton Township. And on January 11, 67, he purchased a 1946-48 vintage uh, plane called Swift. 
and he was going to fly it back to his home. And he bought it in Sheboygan, filed the flight plan that said it would take him about 90 minutes and he would be in Benton Harbor about 5.30 that night. Took off at 5.30. At 6.15, he checked in with FAA, said he was on track, moving the right direction. Plane never arrived. Benton Harbor Police Department contacted the Coast Guard, Civil Air Patrol. Weather in that area was light rain and snow. It wasn't horrible, wasn't great. But nothing was showing up. Edward Dwan was gone. Plane was gone. With a super experienced aviator. Well, if I've never told you about the Civil Air Patrol, I think I need you now. They are a group of volunteers who own planes who search for people. They are a great group of organizations, a great group of different organizations, small little chapters all across the United States. They're like the search and rescue from the air. And I'm forever indebted to those people for their hard work and perseverance at rough times. Well, when Duan disappeared, William Sells, who was a major in the Civil Air Patrol in Michigan, took off the next day and flew from Madison Heights and arrived in Benton Harbor the next day. And the local Civil Air Patrol gave him two spotters to fly with him, look at each side of his plane. Well, he departed Benton Harbor that day at 11.30 in the morning. Plane was due back at 4.30 and never arrived back. So now this is the second plane to go missing in the same spot, looking for a missing plane. Sound weird? So the Civil Air Patrol dispatched 150 planes to look for the two missing planes. A Coast Guard unit sent two helicopters to search the coast and the water. They sent the Coast Guard cutter Woodbink out looking. There was 11 day search for two planes. Four people were missing. Now, in William Sell's plane, he had a woman from Detroit named Ewa House and another man from Detroit named Rodney Lewis. Rodney's dad was a Detroit firefighter and he got hundreds of firefighters to go to that area of Benton Harbor, search the forests, search the beaches. It was an amazing just show of love for their fellow firefighter. Weeks went by where there were private searches. Nothing was being found. And then on August 12th, 1967, the year this happened, and about eight months after uh, Sell's plane disappeared along with Dwan's plane, a fisherman was two, two miles south of South Haven. This is important. Two miles south of South Haven, South Haven, this is Benton Harbor, so two miles south. Fishing boat was out and they saw something floating in the water. And they pulled up and it was Iwa House's body. They pulled the body out of the water and the coroner stated it was confirmed her body by the jewelry that she was wearing. I find that fascinating. Just by the jewelry? Again, there no, was no DNA. They never said that they checked dental work. They said it was jewelry. They said that the lady had a broken skull, arms, legs, and foot. What I find fascinating about that is that neither Sells nor Dwan put out any call for help or that they were having engine trouble. Both Sells and Dwan had decades of flying experience. Same with Captain Lind of Northwest Airlines. You're looking at three of the most experienced pilots I could ever put in front of you 
and they all disappeared. Now, amongst the stories I've told you, House, the lone female in those two planes, is the one that's found. I find that fascinating. Now, I've told you some of these things before, but I want you to pay attention because I'm going to I'm putting this all together into a little bubble for you. So, November 23rd, 1953. Uh, an F89 Scorpion jet from the US Air Force takes off from Truax Field in Wisconsin and crashes into a marsh. So, give you some logistics. This is Benton Harbor where we've been talking about. This is Truax Field. Crashes into the marsh and they don't recover any bodies for several months. And then it's questionable even if they found the pilots from the reports. So that F-89 that crashed, count one, two, three, four, five. Another F-89. This time, this is what an F-89 looks like. This time, the next F-89 takes off from Kinross Airfield in the upper Michigan Peninsula. Now this F-89 knew about the pilots of the F-89 that crashed in the, at Arboretum College in Wisconsin, crossed into the, uh, crashed into the marsh. These guys are gone. The second F-89 was piloted by Lieutenant Felix Moncala and Lieutenant Robert Robert Wilson. Very experienced pilots. And they are on what is quoted as a special assignment in Kinross Airfield, but they're stationed at Truax Field. So a jet from Truax five hours earlier crashes and their pilots are gone. This plane gets a call from Canadian Airspace Control. And I mean, I don't mean up in space, I mean airspace, where planes fly, that an unidentified flying object is crossing over Lake Superior, and they want that jet to scramble to see what it is. So Moncla and Wilson jump in their F-89 and take off over Lake Superior for this UFO. They're going 500 miles an hour at 30,000 feet. And they're giving coordinates about where this thing is located. And they come down and they drop down below 10,000 feet. And the last thing Monclos says is that I'm moving in for a closer look. Radar operators said that the two objects merged together until there was just one. And they never heard from Moncla and his co-pilot again. Now, where was that? That was in this position, right here, about 70 miles north of that point, right near the Canadian-US border. So, the US puts out a series of boats, planes, helicopters, and I'm finding anything. No wreckage on the water, no oil slick on the water. No nothing. Just as they did on Dwan's plane, on Sell's plane, on the Northwest Orient plane. But planes aren't supposed to do that. When they crash, even if they crash into the open water, there's things left on top of the water because some things float, cushions and stuff. But they're not finding anything very similar to MH370. Never found anything. They're claiming that maybe they found something on an island years later, 
But as far as anything big, any confirmation, body parts, no. So why is this all important? That's why it's important to me. The locations from here to here, about 350 miles, give or take. Now, the crash at near Truex Field is in the exact same area of Wisconsin where many young men have disappeared and never been found or have been found under extremely unusual circumstances. The crash of Dwan and Cells, I think it's fascinating. They're all men. They all disappeared. None of them were found. The only person that's found is the only female crash victim. Jet takes off from Kinross, scrambled to chase a UFO. Both men disappeared or never found. So, realistically, two, four, six men disappear. Two F-89s disappear or apparently crash the same day. Now, on that Kinross incident where the F-89 disappeared over Lake Superior, Canada later came out and said, oh, no, 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 we didn't say there was a UFO involved. No, 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 we didn't say that. But U.S. authorities said they did. To scramble a U.S. Air Force jet is a big deal. And this is back in the day when there wasn't a lot of threats up there on the Canadian border. Probably the safest place to be a fighter pilot was there. But, again, I think that what we determined from these cases within the last month is that young adults, young men flying home from school on that Northwest Aryan flight vanished. Where's 58 people? Where's the jet? Come on, think about this. And then we have the UFO allegation from US authorities. Many years ago, I listened to a presentation at a conference given by a retired major from the Air Force. And he talked about the early days when the Air Force would scramble jets to chase UFOs. And he said many of these jets, fighters, would crash, disappear for unbelievable reasons. And he said, and then the Air Force made a decision that if they were going to scramble their fighters, they would make sure they were unarmed. And guess what happened? All of a sudden, the jets started to return. No more jets disappeared. It was a brilliant decision. And that was the gist of this presentation. Why suddenly unarmed? Are they allowed to live, exist? Well... Maybe no longer they're a threat. I don't know. But when you have military personnel that are as sharp as US military pilots, I put a lot of credence in what happens to them. To have two F-89s crash or disappear the same day within five hours in North America is unbelievable. I'm sorry. You believe that's a coincidence? If it is, that's one in 10 million. So, I want you to understand why I'm going through this because I think, in fact, I know for a fact it's important. College kids disappearing in Michigan, I mean in Wisconsin, written about and missing for one of 411 is sobering coincidence. 55 
passengers on a Northwest Air flight disappear just off the coast of Michigan and their entire jetliner is never found. But there were 55 college kids in it. Then you have young college kids that are in William Sell's plane. They disappear. They were spotters. Then you have young adults in their late 20s uh, piloted by Monclaw for the Air Force who disappear and are never found. I think this is important, folks. I think that we have to start focusing in on really the data that grabs us. Now, some of you may be uncomfortable with the topic. I understand that. And when I read, when I uh, wrote Missing 411 Law, Land, Air, and Water, and I had some of these stories in that book, I got a lot of questions about why I was writing about it. And you got to understand, it's not normal to not find an airliner. I don't care what anybody says. I really have my questions about what happened to MH370. But this is Northwest Orient, June 23rd, 1950, when it disappeared in the United States, in our territorial waters. Where is it? If I start to get a little mad, it's because I start to think that the U.S. has to know something about this. They have to. There's too much data out there. Our technology is so far advanced that to think that we can't find a plane, the only thing it makes me think is it's not there. Some other important points. This southern area, so this is uh, Chicago down here. This area of Chicago, people have disappeared right along that coast. All the way going up this coast, people have disappeared. Up on the Upper Peninsula, this, this area near Newberry has a cluster of missing people. This area, cluster of missing people, cluster of missing people. I talked to you about the island here in a video not too long ago in Michigan. Missing people there right near where the F-89 disappeared. I have a, I have a tough time reaching some people and I get frustrated with myself because it's my own inability to express how important I think this is. The Great Lakes, some of the greatest bodies of fresh water in the world. And if you were gonna hide something and have access to much of the United States and you, you could hide it somewhere where no one's gonna look, you'd be putting it in the water. And if you notice, a lot of the research that was going on by Jacques Cousteau and other important figures in the 60s, 70s and 80s, you don't hear about it anymore. Why is that? That's troublesome. If I was the family of one of those 58 people who disappeared on the Northwest flight, I'd be incensed. Incensed because common sense tells you something extraordinary happened. When you're a military family, you just kind of take it for granted that goes with the territory. But Felix Monclo's wife made a statement later in life that the military gave her several different versions about what happened to her husband. One was that he got vertigo and he crashed the plane into the water. Another one was he hit bad weather and broke the plane apart. She said that the stories kept changing as the evidence started to prove, disprove the other story. And it got her frustrated too. Monclo left behind a wife and two kids. Some of those kids may be alive today. I hope they are. Because it's respectful. Their dad died serving our country. Their dad died behind 
a shield of lies by the Canadian government. That is very, very frustrating. I'm sorry if I got emotional today, but these cases I think are super important. And they may not be in your wheelhouse and you might feel uncomfortable talking about them because of the ramifications of it. I understand that. But you know what? We've got to go places where others won't go. I've never heard anybody talking about the content of the Northwest Airlines plane and all of those college kids. And none of them were ever found. None of them were ever identified. Nobody on that plane was ever identified. Do me a favor. Post this on your social media. If you know a pilot, send it to him. If you know somebody that lives in Michigan and Wisconsin, send it to him. If you're Canadian, send it to him. And trust me, I love Canadians. Personally, I, I wish our two countries would merge right now, and you know, especially every every especially Alberta, and I wish they'd come down and join Montana and make our own state. We'd we'd thrive. <laughs> But anyhow, I don't mean to be disrespectful to anybody involved in these stories. It wasn't their fault. I feel very sorry for all the loved ones. And I feel very appreciative that you're here. Thank you for taking the time to listen to these stories, become educated, so people can't take advantage of you later in life. And know that in my heart, I'm trying to do the best I can for you. So please make sure you're subscribed. You can follow me at Can Am Missing, David Politis at Can Am Missing on Twitter. And uh, the links are on this video to watch our documentaries and to purchase our books. $24.99 for our books. I just looked today on Amazon. Lowest price book, $74.97. $74.97. You can buy it from me for $24.99 right now. Anyhow, don't get ripped off. Don't buy anywhere online other than from us. Thank you. I hope you had a good Easter. And I uh, hope I see you soon. Politis out. <laughs>